All right, let's finish up workers comp and then we'll get in the pricing and then it'd be really interesting on Monday. I don't know how far we'll get on pricing today, but that's the big issue we'll have to talk to Mufaro about. We'll see what kind of actuary he is. If he's a pricing actuary, product design, just see what, what his expertise is. And if he's a pricing, then we'll see what states he have because that could be really, really interesting as well. But before we do that, finishing up workers' comp, last Wednesday we talked about uh, what it covers as far as the type of workers and where they are. But the benefits that you get if you get a workers' comp claim, it's essentially one more example of health insurance. We got health insurance all over the place. So here's health insurance. This is the one area of health insurance that is sold by the PNC industry. Most health insurance is sold in the life insurance industry. Same thing with the second one, disability income. Most disability income is sold by the life insurance industry, but you do get disability, disability from workers' comp as well. You probably won't notice it because you don't really know as an employee what's covering you. You don't know if it's your pay time off, which is just a benefit your company provides, or sick leave. And then we get in short-term and long-term disability. You know, when is workers' comp covering it versus your company's covering it? You may not know and you may not care. FLMA is not disability income, but Family Medical Leave Act is an act that allows you to miss work. You don't get paid, but you don't lose your job. These are all parts of um, disability income, but workers' comp specifically covers these type of things for people who are injured on the job. Your, your disability can be temporary. If it's temporary, what they do is they don't start paying you unless you've been out for a certain number of days. That's kind of like a deductible. So you have a waiting period. If it's a permanent total disability, could go the entire rest of your life, um, even past retirement. If it's a partial disability, you can go back to work, but you're not 100%. You're getting covered for some of your costs. So, you know, we'll, we're not going to cover that here in my life insurance class. We talk about that. What does Medicare provide versus what disability income provides? Um, you get certain amounts for different type of injuries. And the laws are not, you know, obviously a construction worker losing a leg is a lot different than an accountant losing a leg. But the rule, the laws are not all that precise. It probably varies by state. But there's just a certain amount. It does provide some life insurance type of things, death benefits and funeral expenses. So workers comp essentially overlaps a lot of life insurance products. The only difference is you get the benefits because you're injured on the job. It does include rehabilitation benefits, which can be pretty expensive, but that's the incentive of the employer to get the workers back on the job. How do states do this? Some states have monopoly run pools. Um, I say six states, but I haven't updated this in a while, so no telling you how many it is today. But I, I essentially a state run insurance plan. Some states have state run plans competing against the insurance industry. Um, it is possible to self insure if you're large enough. You can put the money aside. You know, look at something like a GM. They could probably have their own workers' comp department and just insure themselves. They got you know, a few hundred thousand employees. They're essentially as big as a workers' comp company anyway. Um, so that's certainly possible. USAA didn't. USAA did buy workers' comp from a, another another entity, uh, and that those people were in, in building all the time. All right. So, what are the issues going on with? workers' comp. I did some research on this this last year, and the list hasn't really changed all that much. The Texas and no, the Insurance Council of Texas is having a workers' comp conference. I'm going to see if I can somehow um, crash that and see what they're talking about. I've been watching the in announcements to see if there's any particular issues that they're, they're talking about. Um, but Medical costs are rising, and medical costs is a big part of workers' comp. And so um, this was a big issue for workers' comp back uh, a couple of decades ago. 
Um, So in, in, individuals that have been injured are more likely to live due to better care uh, on the scene, air ambulances, you know, so they're they're trying to uh, address the risk up front to reduce either, well, reduce severity as much as they can. So some of it's good reasons. We're living longer. So since we're living longer, that means we're going to have to cover people much longer. Uh, things that used to kill people back in the 30s and 40s, now we're living another 30, 40 years. Um, there's some fees that are not covered um, by fee schedules, so ICUs, extensive durable medical equipment, state-of-the-art care. So essentially a lot of this is similar stuff you saw with healthcare reform, that it's just costs are going up, we're getting much fancier equipment, People are living longer. They're staying in the hospital longer. Um, so they're seeing all the same things that the health insurance industry is seeing. Um, it is making our quality of life better, but it does also mean uh, it costs more. Um, and um, those took my health insurance class. I mean, they're spending some hospitals spending on millions of dollars on a new piece of equipment they've got to get that thing used and so they're going to use it and there's some question whether or not it actually makes them better some of the robotic um surgery surgery things there's no evidence they're even better but they are much more expensive so all of that relates to healthcare. uh loss control is a big part of this um can you make your workplace safer and if you can you should get a benefit from your workers comp insurance company and so if you're working in a workers' comp area, I worked in USA's workers' comp area for one week. <laughs> um, you have an incentive to do a project and you justify the cost of the project by how much it saves you on your workers' comp insurance. And so you, you kind of justify that. Um, small companies, that's not going to help them because they're not going to get any kind of experience cut in their rates. And the rate set setting process is not always economic, so you may not get as much benefit. For a firm like even USAA, there's things they can do that could definitely cut their costs uh, quite dramatically. <clears throat> and then work itself is changing. There was, uh, I don't know where the new status is, but there was in California starting covering um, mental illness, which was hard to tie to the job. But what they discovered when they passed the law is people were taking a job just to get the coverage. And then they would just claim the workers' comp because they wanted coverage. So it caused the cost to rise directly. Stress-related ailments like heart disease, can you tie those? Some people have tied that to workers' comp. Obviously, asbestos, industrial uh, things. We talked about secondhand smoke. We saw it wasn't a workers' comp claim, but it was actually... A lawsuit against the tobacco companies, but I think they could have made a workers' comp claim. Uh, and a lot of times, workers' comp is the courts may agree this really isn't workers' comp, but there's no one else to pay this, and they may just saddle it on the workers' comp side. Um, and in a changing role of work, working from home, is how you, you you know you could have made almost your entire paper on workers' comp just from what has worked from home, been doing the workers' comp. Um, driving to work while on your cell phone. So obviously the cell phone has changed things. Here's a um, article. This might work for your team here. I don't know if y'all saw this article on distracted drivers. Nothing happens. There you go. Um, <clears throat> But this one's related, this is what I was telling you about. So this distracted driver was awarded workers' compensation uh, for an accident that, that she had caused by her work-related cell phone. Her name, Turpin, she was a hospice nurse. She was on call. She was required to be reachable by pager. Y'all even know what a pager is? <laughs> Does anyone have a pager anymore? They don't do they exist? They seem like to be unnecessary. In this case, uh, the employee was had to the employee was contacted and they had to respond within 15 minutes. Um, she was paged a second time. 
If she didn't respond, she'd be called on her cell phone. If she didn't re respond, she'd be called on her home phone. So she had to always keep checking her beeper. And at the time of the accident, she was driving home from work when her cell phone light caught her attention, caused her to glance down. She drove the car off the road in the gravel and she wrecked her vehicle and injured herself. She sought medical payment from an employer for the whipsalash she suffered. She argued that she hadn't glanced down at her cell phone. The employer said no, because um, she wasn't on the job. She was just checking to see if she should be on the job. <laughs> um, if there is a causal connection between the claimant's injury and the condition under which the employer requires the work to be performed, and that's her argument, right? I'm required to check my phone. You're making me do that. Uh, the injury must be able to fairly be traced to the employment as contributing approximate cause and does not originate from a hazard to which the claimant would have been equally exposed. Uh, she used her cell phone for both personal and business related. Um, she paid the phone bill and it was unclear if the call the structure was business related. She's not even arguing that her firm was calling her. She just said, my firm, you know, if, it, if I didn't have this requirement, I wouldn't have checked her phone. Now, we know that may not be true, right? We know a lot of people are, yeah, I, I should, shouldn't tell you the story, but I will. But I was driving over here, four-way stop or three-way stop. I stop. Another car is coming. It's my turn. I start to turn. She's on her cell phone, doesn't see the stop sign. So I just slam on my brakes. I don't honk. I don't do anything. I stop so she doesn't hit me. And guess what she does when she passes me? gives me the finger. I'm like, why are you shooting the finger at me? I didn't honk at you. I didn't yell at you. I just said, uh, I didn't do anything. I didn't say like, go ahead. I mean, it's like, I just stopped. And I don't know if she's mad at me, but she was on her phone the whole time. I guess maybe she didn't know there was a stop sign there and thought, why is this guy turning in front of me? But anyway, but, but anyway, this distract, talk about a distracted driver, but um, maybe she's a nurse on call. And that's way maybe my situation. She was giving me the finger. It's like, Hey, I'm going to save someone's life. I'm sure that was it. Uh, <laughs> So there are there there's say hey it's that wasn't a required act um, so you know so they came out in her favor and it was a, a workers comp claim um, now you might ask does she have health insurance why didn't her health insurance cover her? but she would have had a deductible there whatever car damage she should have had auto um, what if she had you know let's make it really really complicated what if she had medical under the auto. <laughs> And she had health insurance and she has work. Who's going to pay whom? Why is she taken to court? You kind of assume she didn't have the insurance. Uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's a complicated case. But there's another case of distracted driver. But this one's specifically getting you to uh, workers comp. What about people who just drive for work? Salespeople. What about if you're working on someone else's sites and it's that other site that causes you damage? Do you sue that employer? Or do you go to workers comp for your employer? And we have more people that are partially retired. So they're coming into work and they have different needs. They may not be as mobile. Um, nature of the work, this is the first thing I, I noticed. So uh, when I worked at workers comp for a week, uh, I, I worked in risk management for a week. Uh, I, I took this job because my job, my boss was kind of not letting us do new projects. So I would go do something else and then he wanted his old job back, and so I had to take his job when he moved back. So I was only there a week. They didn't really like me that much, but I actually learned a lot in that week. And guess what was the number one uh, workers' comp claim we saw? Any guesses? It's the same injury over and over and over again. I don't think it's a big issue anymore, is it? Cor corporal tunnel? Y'all still hear that? So... People on their computers, corporal tunnel was really harming people. When it first came out, employers like, oh, just get over it, you know, stretch out a little bit. They thought it was exaggerated. Yeah. And then they just started discovering these are actually pretty serious injuries. I don't know what people are doing today, uh, but at USA, they they redid all the desks, they redid the keyboards, everything, and it got really irritating. Um, you go sit at someone else's desk that's much different height than you are and you're going to bang your knees, you know, so it got really, really kind of strange. But I don't know if that fixed the problem because the problem seemed to have kind of disappeared. You can go out on, on YouTube and see people who are like court reporters completely just 
this disability, they really couldn't do anything, any other kind of work. Um, so the nature work has changed. I don't know what AI is going to do to that. Um, so what about these cell phones causing cancer and your employer requires that? You know, who, who knows why? That's why we have those lawyers out there trying to make these connections. What about COVID and pandemics? If your firm doesn't provide enough protection or you catch COVID at work, uh, those kind of things. We'll see what autonomous vehicles do if we actually get to those. And then gig work. So this has been a big issue. Um, I think it's McDonald's. So McDonald's had this, um, I don't know if I can find it, but McDonald's had, had this big debate of um, are McDonald's employees employees of McDonald's or employees of the franchise? Of the franchise, they may not have any workers' comp because the franchise would be really small. But if they're an employee of McDonald's, they have it. And so each state's going to say different things. California was probably, I think, the state that said, no, those employees are McDonald's employees. They get health care. They, they follow all the rules of California for a large employer. Uber's gone through the same thing, right? Are Uber's drivers, are they employees of Uber? Are they independent contractors? Uh, so the gig work, who's doing gig in here? Get which team. So yeah, that might be an issue. You might, um, you know, that's that's one way to uh, essentially get them insured, at least for workers' comp. Maybe not for. I don't know if you're going to take a workers' comp angle. That may be too much to, to go for. Um, all right. So yeah, definitely the world is it's changing pretty dramatically, uh, and it probably will the next few years as well. Um. Fraud is a big issue in workers' comp. Um, there's a coalition against fraud. They said they anytime you see something called coalition against insurance fraud, you really can't trust their numbers because they have an incentive to have the biggest number possible. <laughs> but they say it's billions of dollars. Um, how do people, what kind of fraud is there? Someone's injured not on the job, but away from the job, and they get their buddies, though. So, you know, uh, roll them into the work and throw them down the escalator so they can say they got injured on the job. That would be illegal. Um, inflating their injuries. I might show you one of those. I can't remember which videos I have, but uh, they have a minor injury at work, but they lie about it in order to get workers' comp. Faking an injury, obviously. Um, that's also a felony. You go to jail for that. If you have an old injury and you, you try to get it covered by having it come back at work somehow, you know, have something drop. Um, is the workers able to come back to work? They're fully healed, but they pretend they're still disabled so they can stay away from work because some people actually hate their jobs. Um, sometimes abuse is exaggerated because they, they say it's abuse because a doctor orders an extra test just to be sure of diagnosis and say, well, you really, we really shouldn't have ordered that test. And they'll count that as abuse, even if the test actually finds something. So I don't know if, I, well, we'll see if I want to watch these. There's a, some of these are a little embarrassing to watch, but we'll see. Some of them I almost can't watch because these guys, and I saw some of these last semester when we were doing disability income, so. Oh yeah, this one, I can't watch this one, but I'll show it to you anyway. So this you can get it on film with your picture, what your name is. Y'all remember this from last semester? All right, so this guy, I don't know if it's workers' comp or just a disability, but it's the same kind of issue. This says workers' comp, so it must be workers' comp. And he's saying he was injured and that he now has the mentality of like a six-year-old. He doesn't have a mentality of a six-year-old. He's a full adult with full capacity. But now... He didn't think through this. If this is going to be your scam, what does that mean every time you leave your house? <laughs> you got to act like that. And so I'll show you the end of it. It's just too awkward for me to watch. But this, well, here he is. He even kept playing golf. Which is where the cops arrested him for insurance fraud. You know, Watch this. 
And so he immediately flips back into it. I mean, that's that's bad thing, right? Because if you do this fraud, you got to act like that. If you're in a wheelchair, you got to be in the wheelchair every time you leave your house. No, it's just not a smart way to. I don't know if I have any others. Oh, this one. This guy, a little extreme as well. Working for a living and finds a clever way to extend the length of the stay on the disabled list. Right before his visit to the doctor, Steve would strike his formerly injured hand over and over. The oh. hands would irritate the hand, giving it the appearance of being inflamed. He would do this in his driveway and in traffic on the way to the doctor's office. Unfortunately for Steve, his insurance company didn't trust his lingering injury and they videotaped his trips to the yeah. doctor. There's some people hate their jobs a lot. I don't know if I have any other. Oh, here's here's a guy with a really badly injured back. Scamming for workman's comp insurance might be a great idea if it works. But when it doesn't, well, that's when you catch people in some of the most unbelievable lives you'll ever hear. Like people who are so hurt they can't work, but they can't go bowling. That's what happened to this guy. He filed a claim for injured left knee that oh, supposedly no, prevented him from doing his job. But an undercover camera busted up on the lanes, bowling at a couple of pretty nice frames, judging by his reaction. Of course, the tape went to his So. I don't know how many years you go to jail, but that is a felony. You do go to jail for that. It's a pretty serious event. Um, so. Yeah, so fraud's an issue. I don't know what the second one is. Y'all can look at them. It's There's several ways you'll see this. So uh, Medicare has these type of frauds. Uh, our Social Security has a disability. Life insurance companies have disability. Workers' comp. They're all the same thing. It's people who say they were injured and they're you know, disability income, you don't have to be injured on the job. You're just saying you're injured, but they're all the same type of thing. People faking injuries. Um, so they're out there. Um, there are employers that commit fraud as well by now. So the way workers comp works is you send the workers comp insurance company a file of all your workers with their you know, their salaries. And that's what they're going to charge their premium against. But if you under if you exaggerate down your salaries they're going to charge you a lower premium that would be fraud um if you say um workers are more experienced than they actually are make them look less risky any kind of lying you do that would be fraud um if they get workers comp required by law and then they cancel the coverage are they don't get the coverage, but they tell their employees they are covered, that would be fraud. So there are some fraud on the employer side. Probably not the big main employers, you know, USA, you're, they're going to buy, they're not going to take that risk. So, uh, so fraud's always an issue with any kind of disability income because there are people out there that would rather not work than work. <clears throat> Another big area is claims admin. This is what I saw at USA, which is essentially an outsourcing function of workers' comp. Um, so you, you use the workers comp to manage these injured employees. The issue is going to be if you outsource it too much, um, the employer is too distant from the employee and the employee kind of loses that connection. Um, you've got to get the employee back pretty quickly because people kind of get, we kind of get lazy. I think COVID kind of did that to a lot of us. They just got used to not going in the office and then suddenly, uh, they don't want to go back ever again. Um, if you do this stuff internally, you're going to have to actually hire an actuary. And a lot of firms don't want to do that. USA had several actuaries that had nothing to do with their insurance business. They had a, a healthcare actuary. They had a um, pension actuary. So uh, it's expensive. You got to hire a fairly high paid professional to manage this. Um, so it is. it does save you money using the insurance company. But the goal is get your worker back as quickly as possible so that they don't get in the habit of not coming in. Um, this one, I think, is probably not going to happen, but people talk about it. And that is, why do we have disability income, health insurance, and all these different programs? Why don't we just merge them all in one big program? So why do you care if they're covered by disability or workers' comp? Just, just cover them. Um, you see this more internationally. The reason it's so different in the United States 
is that ERISA is federal and workers' comp is the state. And so those two groups don't care what the other is doing. They're not going to coordinate in any way. And as long as that's the case, I don't think you're going to see much coordination between these two. You also have um, OSHA. Y'all know who OSHA is? <laughs> so making sure workplaces are safe. They don't coordinate with ERISA. So ERISA is the federal program, program that, that um, regulates employee benefits, whether it's 401k plans or pension plans. OSHA regulates workplace safety, and then states regulate workers' comp because it's insurance. These groups don't have to talk to each other. They don't have to anyway coordinate whatsoever. So it's unlikely you're going to see that. What you are seeing, and I don't have it in here, but the employers make it all look one program. You're seeing that more. So from the employee standpoint, they don't notice the different programs at all. Just, and that's what I noticed at USAA. You didn't notice if you're on disability or workers' comp, you're just getting paid for not being at work. You didn't really care. You just want to make sure your bills were paid. So, <clears throat> And then working back to getting employees back to work as soon as possible, most employers now are spending money on return to work programs. A lot of it is paying a lot more money for a rehabilitation services. Um, so what kind of workers just don't want to come back to work? I can think of a lot of them. I worked for McDonald's for a month. I don't think I could any of y'all work fast food more than a month. Can, can you handle it? Could you do it for five years? I mean, it's a pretty rough job, isn't it? Pretty tough life. Uh, I mean, if you had to, you would do it, but it's, it's pretty tough. I can see why fast food workers switch jobs constantly because you just want some change. You can get a benefit. Doing this. So I can understand why people just don't want to come back to work. Um, so it's going to be tough in some places. A lot of those employees may not be coverable workers comp anyway. But, um, so they're going to first will spend money on a, a, a program that's going to help the employee understand what work can you do. Um, and then what does the job require and then match them up. So maybe they can't come back to their former job, but they can at least come back to some jobs. So you're paying them and getting some value out of their work. And rehab can be a big part of that. I went to rehab once for when I separated my little finger in Costa Rica. Uh, I thought it was a waste of time and money. Um, I didn't notice anything. So I went there for like six months or three months and then I went back to the hand doctor and he said, oh, just put a rubber band around your finger and that'll fix it. And that fixed everything. That was a five minute conversation versus. So I don't know. It probably varies depending on the injury. I think I had an injury. They really couldn't help, but they really liked the money. And so they they said, hey, let's try this. This will really help you. And it did nothing. But I'm sure there's places where they're really, really quite, quite valuable. Um, so it may move to a different job that's less demanding for our time or even permanently. Um, but that takes a lot of time, right? You got to sit down with the worker. So when I was at USA on workers comp, um, we had a meeting with the workers comp insurer. They walked in with a stack of paper this high and they just went through each one. So they say the person's name and the USA employee knew exactly who they were. How are they doing? They've been out for six months. Oh yeah, she was blah, blah, blah this last month. But I, I think she may be back in this next file next file. It's time consuming. It's expensive. But you, I could see real quickly why you outsource that because the workers comp people, they knew these people extremely well and it saved USAA a lot of time. Um, and obviously, if the worker doesn't want to come back, it's it's going to fail. I think, you know, this is beyond the else. I'm amazing what TV shows are even too old for y'all. But the office, I think, had a workers comp fraud uh, scenario once. Y'all remember that? I think Oscar... It may not have been workers' comp on me, disability, but I think Oscar was out on a fraudulent workers' comp oh. thing, but I can't remember. But, um, I mean, it's, you know, we kind of know about it and just from, from pop culture that people will fake an injury. <laughs> Cyber has become a little bit of an issue. I saw some workers' comp companies talking about this. Ransomware, those type of things. Um, courts haven't really, you know, how do you tie this back to workers' comp. Um, 
So I don't, I don't know. It's 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 a new thing. How's the how's the worker actually uh, injured? Um, but anyway, so th that one's an interesting one. And more and more firms are taking responsibility for making the workplace a pleasant place, non-hostile place to work. Um, so how does that impact workers' comp? Um, thinking about workplace well-being. Many organizations um, have questionnaires for their employees to try to figure out where are those opportunities. Um, so that's that's changing as well. So workers' comp, if you're an actuary, you could spend your whole career just in workers' comp. It would be a, a field that's pretty specialized. Um, I don't know who the major workers, there is a massive workers' comp company in Texas because I hear them on WOI compensation. I hear them on WOI every once in a while. There it is, workers' comp, Texas workers' comp. Um, that's a Berkshire Hathaway company. I don't know who that is. I don't know if y'all heard on WI, they'll brag about the dividend they just paid or some such. They're not advertising to the employee, they're advertising to employers, but they do advertise. Um, all right, so that's it for all of the products. So you have some sense of what this industry does. Um, there may be a few other minor, minor project products. We'll see when we look at the accounting statements, uh, things like fire or some other, some kind of other minor products that are really kind of a, a small detour from, uh, from, um, homeowners insurance. Some that I haven't covered is farm insurance. That I have no knowledge of, but crop, I, I guess we could call it crop insurance. Um, so I don't know what firms cover that. That would be a really specialized area of, of finance. Um, I, there's some really, really specialized alien abduction insurance. I don't know who, who sells that. I would sell that. So people do, there's trusted choice. They even have a picture of flying software. Um, perhaps a strange type of indemnity coverage. I don't know how they indemnify you, right? Indemnity means they bring you back to where you were before the accident happened. Designed to protect humans from trauma suffered following alien abductions. You have post-traumatic stress that may arise from the alien sighting. Abductions could potentially cause harm and grief, uh, especially if they become impregnated. I mean, is this a serious sight or is it a joke? I mean, I, I, I even have fine an agent. One of y'all should just call and get a quote just to see <laughs> if it's real. Um, so I, I I can't say I covered everything. So that's the difference between PNC and life. On the life insurance side, you can cover really all of the products. There are already that many specialized ones out. The PNC side, I mean, a good, another good example we didn't talk about, which is on the auto insurance side, but it's pretty important, is um, motorcycle insurance. It's specialized because obviously the risk are very different, especially the property risk versus the bodily injury risk. I don't think USA even did motorcycle when I was there. I think they outsourced it to somebody else. Um, any of our ride motorcycles in here? You do, do you have motorcycle insurance? Yes. Is it pretty expensive versus yes. your car? Is it more than the car or less? Uh, well, I, use, I have different insurance. Okay. With with the same one, it'd be more. But I have Progressive for motorcycle insurance. Yeah, I think USA used Progressive. Progressive is an interesting yeah. company. Progressive used to be a high-risk insurer. So they only take the worst drivers and the worst risk. And so USA actually outsourced all of their worst risks to Progressive, but then Progressive became more normal. So I don't know if they still do that. Yeah, there's Progressive right there. Well, only $75 a year. That sounds pretty cheap. Mm, that, <laughs> that covers your, your back tire. Yeah. <laughs> so so there's probably other, we'll see some when we look at the list, but we, we've covered the major ones, you know, 95% of the premiums. All right, we're going to shift gears here and get into the big math problem for the second exam. 
And this is good timing here. We, we got a little time here. We can get, get an introduction when a referral comes in. So insurance pricing, um, it's essentially a discounted cash flow with frequency and severity added in. So an insurance price is the present value of the claims you're going to pay out plus your expenses at some discount rate. Um, and you got to figure out what those claims are going to be. So it's a forecasting process. For life insurance, you got to go out 50, 60 years. You got to figure out when the person's going to die. But you have you have a lot more confidence in that number. We have a pretty good idea how many 50 year olds are going to die in the next 5, 10, 20 years. Auto insurance, homeowners insurance typically only goes out 12 months. So they don't have to be, they only think about 50 years. Um, but it's still a much more difficult product because so many things can change. So the premium you charge today is the present value of future claims. I should have put expenses in there. The discount rate we're going to use is what we expect to earn on the investments. That's the earnings on the float. When can the claims be paid in the future where there's two types of products? This is only PNC side. The life insurance side doesn't talk about this. We have short tail lines like auto physical damage. You have long tail lines like the general liability for asbestos where the person can be disabled for 50 years. So short tail lines, usually a year, you know. You notice I said auto physical damage because auto liability could go on for quite a while. It could go on for years and years and years. In fact, we're not gonna talk about this in this class, I don't think, but there's something called structured settlements. So what a structured settlement is, it's someone, and we did this at USA, so when someone on the property casualty side has an auto accident or is injured by your one of your in, insured and it causes them an injury for the rest of their life. You now got to pay this person twenty thousand dollars a year for the next fifty years. Let's say USA figures that out and they say, okay, we got to pay this person twenty thousand a year for the next whatever many years. We're not in the business of doing that. So they then call the USA Life Insurance Company and says, we want to set up this annuity to pay this person twenty thousand bucks. What will you charge us to do that for them? Um, and the life insurance says, well, when do we start to pay, stop the payments? Well, as soon as he dies, the payments stop. Say, so, okay, well, now I've got to get a life actuary to figure out when this person's going to. So you can see why the PNC side wants to sit that over to the life insurance side. So USA life insurance companies would sell structured settlements to the property casualty company to get it off their books. And then the life insurance actuaries are better able to, to handle them. And probably the uh, insured prefers that better anyway. Uh, and well, here it is. Plus you add in the expenses. The loading includes those expenses plus the profit. So the gross premium is what you charge. That's the pure premium. The pure premium is the present value of the claims plus the present value, not the expenses, but the present value of the expenses, that includes loss adjustment expenses and underwriting expenses, plus whatever return on capital you need, whatever profit you need. That's what your gross premium. And this is how the state looks at it. The state looks at all of this. What's the present value of your claims? What's your expenses? What's your return on capital? And this is where I got involved in the process at USA is I had the document for the states what USA's return on capital was how much the actuaries needed to make on this product. So when we read the Warren Buffett thing, uh, we talked about float, um, the cost of float, cost of the insurance reserves, all of that. So that's somewhat implied in these numbers. What makes you insurance unique when it comes to pricing is most firms when they price a product they know much how much it costs when they sell it for insurance companies they don't know their cost of goods sold until the future they have to see how many claims are are paid how many uh, adjusters they need um, so you've got to somehow do that forecast for short-term lines you know pretty quickly usually within two years even even with bodily injuries you're going to know pretty quickly Homeowners is a short tail line. Usually catastrophes can take longer because it just takes longer to rebuild all of that. 
and then asbestos can be a really, really long tail line. We'll see that when we look at Schedule P. I, I really love looking at Schedule P. You'll see when we look at Schedule P for auto insurance, that only goes out two years, or for others, it will go out 10 plus years. <laughs> so what is the return on capital for an insurance company? And guess what I use with the states? I use the capital asset pricing model, just like you do in your class. Why did I use CAPM? Because it's well recognized. Everybody sees it, understands it. So I just use CAPM. Um, the only state that questioned CAPM was Washington State, and they just questioned one of my assumptions. So it wasn't even like. So as long as you use CAPM, you were fine because it was well recognized. Everybody expect, respected that. So how did I use CAPM? So let's let's talk about this. What's the formula for CAPM? Y'all got this memorized, don't you? Go ahead. Risk-free rate plus the beta times the difference between the risk-free rate and the market rate. Yeah, the market risk premium. Yeah, I don't put that. No one in finance, but yeah. I always have to remember that. The textbooks, y'all do that minus thing. But in practice, we don't do that. But that is what it is. All right, so the risk-free rate, that was pretty easy, right? Just go get the 10-year treasury yield. Market risk premium, that was pretty easy for me because we had the Ibbotson book and he he published a market risk premium. So I just use this number because I'm going to the States. I don't want to use my number because I think, you know, I'm going to inflate it. But if I use a well-published number, I'm good. So the big trick is beta. How did I get USAA's beta? How do you get a beta for a non-publicly traded company? And I get their stock price and regress it against the market. That doesn't work. So how would I, any guesses how I did that? How would you do that? I guess that's the better question. So the actuaries came to me and said, Ron, well, actually, they came to my coworker and she wasn't a finance major. So she didn't know what happened. So I taught her all of all of this stuff. Um, so they came to her and I said, hey, if I were you, I would do this. So what do you think I told her or what would you have told her? How would you get a beta for HEB or USAA? HEB might be easier. How would you get HEB's beta? I know some of you are thinking of the right answer. You just don't want to say it. Did HEB use Kroger's beta? Would that be all right? That could make sense, right? So what I did is I went out and looked at 11. Well, I don't know if I had 11. I looked at 11 companies. They weren't all publicly, but let's say publicly rated comparable insurers. So I didn't do Tub because they're commercial. I didn't do Aetna because they're health insurance. I didn't do MetLife because they're mainly life insurance. I didn't do Prudential. Prudential has a PNC company, but their biggest company is life insurance. So what I did is I, I used the uh, the NAIC's database, and I went, and one of my rules is at least 50% of their business had to be home, personal homeowners and auto, because USAA was 90%. So if you weren't at least 50%, I, I kicked them out, and they had to be publicly traded. I got all of the betas, betas, and I took the median and average beta, and then I adjusted it for leverage, because USA is much better capitalized than these other firms, and so their beta is going to be a little bit lower. What beta do you think we had? Let's go look at a beta for an insurance company. Let's look, what do you think is a good publicly traded competitor to USAA? What would be wrong with progressive? Why wouldn't I use progressive? Not enough what? What commercials do you see for progressive? Mainly auto, right? I think they've dabbled in homeowners. I think they'd be stupid to get in homeowners because that's a really painful. Why don't I use Geico? No homeowners, but what else? I can't get Geico, can I? Because it's part of Berkshire Hathaways. So any guesses? What's the largest peer? Why, why not State Farm? 
not publicly traded. Can y'all think of it? I'll give you the first letter. I'll say, yeah. I'll say it was one I could go to. And they say they're beta. There's no way that's the right beta. They say the beta is 0.51. Why is that something strange that's happened? So sometimes the betas in here are really good, but this is just the last five years monthly. And who knows what's going on with the insurance industry that it may be distorting the number. Insurance companies typically have betas around one to slightly higher than one. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but their assets are very sensitive to the economy because it's just stocks and bonds, but the claims are unrelated to the economy. So they have assets that are highly correlated but liabilities that are uncorrelated. And the net is they're about a one. Generally, for an all say I'll use like a 1.05 1, 1 or 110. Those that have had me in other classes, I do the rolling beta thing, and that's what I would have done here, come up with the beta. But uh, wow, did I get the right company? Wow, look at that. All state lost money. That's pretty, whoa, that's pretty freaky. Wow. We saw, you know, I showed you that insurance companies are raising rates for hike pretty dramatically. And look at that, two years. Of, I wonder when the last time they had two years of losses in a row. That's that's kind of scary. Wow, that's pretty amazing. It went from five million dollars to negative one point three million. Now, this five million may be exaggerated. Why might that be exaggerated for twenty twenty? Frequency was less. Yeah, COVID being down, so that that may be too 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 low. I mean, too high. But yeah, that's pretty freaky. But I would go out and essentially get their beta over five year rolling periods. So all all that they show here on Yahoo Finance is what their beta calculation was just these last five years. We had COVID in there. There's other things going on, so it's possible it's a distorted number. Um, but Another problem with Allstate is Allstate has a sizable life insurance company. So that's going to distort the numbers as well. You know, so it, it's hard to get a pure play. Um, you know, you look at a Chubb, which is mainly commercial insurance. Their betas looks low too. These are betas that are way too low. So there's probably something going on with the industry right now that's just causing it. You have really low betas. Yeah, I wouldn't use the beta below one for an insurance company at all. I should do a rolling beta for one of these companies and show them to you next class just so we can just see how unstable it is. All right, so that's that's how I did it. So I had to start by figuring out who were the competitors. And then and I did 50%, even though you know that doesn't mean they're really exactly like USA, but I, I couldn't go lower than that. I'd run out of companies to look at. Um, <clears throat> And then return on capital then is how much capital do you need? I don't really, uh, boy, I don't know if I want to get into this, but um, y'all remember Miller and Medigliani? Have y'all had them before? Your actuaries might see it on the exam. Who remembers Miller and Medigliani? Anybody? Who's never heard of these two guys ever in their life? Oh, my word. Did y'all take corporate finance? Yeah. Ah, go back and look at the notes. Go back to the textbook and look them up. So here they are. There's images of them. You're, they both have passed away. Modigliani, um, he was born in 1918. He died at 85. And then Martin, you probably heard of Martin Miller, haven't you? He's a pretty famous guy. He made it to 77. Um, so what they're saying, one of them won a Nobel Prize and one of them didn't. So um, Medigliani, since he lived longer, he had to be living to win the Nobel Prize. And since Miller died first, he just lost out on it. Um, well, it says he was. Uh, maybe I guess they both did. I thought only one got it. But um, there's Harry Markowitz and William Sharp as well. Yes. University of Chicago. So they their whole thing was on capital structure. So if you remember that, I don't know, does this chart look familiar with to you? You should have had this in corporate finance. Anybody recognize that chart? The chart, no, but we did have this in corporate So optimal capital structure, you remember yeah. that? 
don't want to graduate if you don't know this. And I'm guessing your actuary is going to see it on an exam. It is kind of there. So this one here, what's what are they telling you here? That there's the perfect amount of debt for tax benefits. Right. So debt and tax is a big part of this. So here's your cost of equity. Why is it rising? It's rising because you're using more debt. I don't know if I can copy this image and bring it in somewhere. Yeah, definitely. Y'all make sure y'all know this before you graduate. This is like one of the most famous. I mean, they got a Nobel Prize for it, right? So it's got to be somewhat important. Although I saw some of the early Nobel Prizes. And I was like, they won a prize for that. This is same. But this one was pretty important. So your cost of equity goes up as you add debt, right? That's why I said I use a lower beta for USA than for competitors because it has a much better capital structure. And debt is cheaper capital, cost of capital. So what they're, what they're saying is, what is the cost of capital for the firm as you increase the debt? And you notice that the cost of capital for the firm, known as WAC, is declining as they add more debt. And the wrong answer is it's declining because debt is cheaper than equity. But the wrong reason that's wrong is as you add debt that's cheaper, your cost of equity goes up and the two exactly offset each other before taxes. So their answer before taxes, it doesn't matter because you add debt, yeah, debt's cheaper, but your cost of equity capital goes up. Y'all remember this now? Is it starting to come back to you? Um, so why does this line come down? It doesn't come down because debt is cheaper. It comes down because debt is tax deductible. So as you add debt, the taxpayer covers some of your cost of capital. All right. And this is called the tax shield of debt. Now, why does it start going back up then? Bankruptcy costs. Yeah, bankruptcy. As you add too much debt, your firm ceases to operate. Employees quit because they're worried about the firm. Uh, your bondholders put all these restrictions on you. You can't make decisions because you can't invest cap. You can't do any capex. So at some point, uh, your cost of capital starts going up. And so what Millard Miguelin said before taxes and bankruptcy costs, it doesn't matter. You can be 100% equity. You can be 99.99% debt. It doesn't matter. The value of the firm doesn't change. After tax and with bankruptcy costs, there is actually an optimal structure, capital structure of a firm. Now, who actually calculates this? Did y'all do it in your class, actually calculate numbers? Yeah, um, Dr. Damodaran does that in his class as well. I don't know any firms that actually do it. Um, did he talk about firms that actually do this? Because I don't I don't know any that do. I mean, they may think about it theoretically, but I don't, I don't know if there's already any that do. So that's the theory behind capital structure. Um, so that's all summarized here. Now, why don't I give you all of that? When you come to financial firms, this changes quite dramatically because this equity piece, how much you have in net worth, regulators view that as protection for uh, your depositors and your uh, policyholders. So, they don't let banks and insurance companies go to the optimal level because they're going to say you have to have this much capital all right so banks and insurance companies are probably not big fans of miller Bedigliani because the regulars step in have y'all heard of bank tier one capital so if you interview with a bank ever you want to do the basel accords and read through those so if you're going to interview with J.P. Morgan or uh, Wells Fargo on the corporate side, not on the investment side, but on the corporate side. Yeah, you need to understand bank capital requirements. Um, the Basel Accords, I didn't spell Basel. I, I spelled Basel like in Faulty Towers, but let me spell it correctly here. <clears throat> and Wikipedia does a great job on it. So you don't need much more than that. But they're going to tell you how much net worth does J.P. Morgan need. And we know it's not much, right? They got... Three trillion in assets, only about three hundred billion, two hundred fifty billion in net worth. But the the regulators are going to dictate what that is. Uh, and you can look through the different uh, gyrations of that over time. 
insurance companies have something called risk-based capital, RBC. We'll, we'll get into that some, but it's the regular to say, hey, given the risk that you're taking, this is how much net worth you need. Walmart doesn't have that. Um, Exxon doesn't have that. They can they can set their equity based on what gives them the highest value for the firm. Insurance companies have to make sure and make the regulators happy. We'll talk more about risk-based capital out there. So for outside of financial services, capital is debt and equity, and you maximize it based on what Minimum Rajagani said. Financial services, when you use the word capital in this industry, they only mean equity. It's just a nomenclature of this industry. <clears throat> so if you go to Walmart and say, hey, what's your capital structure? They're going to talk about debt and equity. You go to Prudential and talk about capital, they're, they're thinking you're talking about their net worth. It's just the way actuaries think. It's the way the finance people think of these companies. So they'll say, do we have enough capital for our risk? They don't mean, do we have enough debt and equity for our risk? I mean, do we have enough net worth to cover our risk? So you are working in a little bit different world. So I wanted to warn you that what you were taught in your corporate finance class won't work at a bank and insurance company, but then for 90% of y'all, you didn't get the first part of that. So I, you know, I don't have to worry about it, but you still should know Miller Bidigani, especially if you're a finance major, it is a pretty important one. Which class did you do it in? Was it Catapacla? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure he would cover this pretty mm -hmm. important stuff. Um, all right. I was in a department called capital management for seven horrible years of my life where I was working seven days a week, just crazy, crazy hours. But that was the name of the department, capital management, working with all the entities. And it really was about how much net worth does this entity need to cover its risk and what should its return on capital be? What kind of ROE should it get to cover its risk? So that was my job. Uh, it was a pretty fun job. I got to meet with the bank, the insurance companies. It was a really, really good job other than never going home. Uh, all right. So your premium is your pure, pure premium, which is the present value of your claims, plus the present value of your expenses, plus your profit. Your profit is gonna be a required return on equity times your required capital. And that's gonna be based on something regulators tell you. All right. So that's the basic equation for an insurance company. So when the actuaries came to my department and said, we need help with this part, because they're gonna price a premium that's gonna cover all of this. And the regulars have to approve all of that. Guess who's gonna do the first two parts? Actuaries or finance? Actuaries, even the expenses part, the actuaries do. That was true on the life insurance side as well. You might think core finance get involved in expenses, but the actuaries do all of that. But on the profit side, on the life insurance side, the actuaries did the profit side as well. But on the property caddies side, the profit part of the formula went to, I was in my department, capital management, which is exactly what we did. We figure out how much return you need given your risk. And then on the profit side, this is the equation I had. What return do we need? And y'all remember what did I use here? William Sharp, what did I use? Cap M. And then what I use here, whatever our risk-based capital requirements were. And so the actuaries say, hey, we need a 11% return and our CapEx, our uh, capital, um, capital requirements from regulators is this. They need to add that much to their premium so they make that return. How many times do they have to do that? Do it in Texas. Y'all remember what happens in Texas? In Texas, as long as it's within, within the band, they're fine. California, California has to approve every single rate on their time scale. It takes six months, it takes nine months, whatever it takes. So how many times do they have to do this? 50 times. If it's Montana, it takes three minutes. If it's Hawaii, it takes three years, whatever. You know, it's just different. In fact, in Georgia, I don't know if it's still true. In Georgia, it wasn't the state of Georgia. Georgia it was every county in Georgia. 
the other file stuff. It was just crazy. So, and maybe Mufara, I hope Mufara can talk about this because on the auto side, this is a big, big, big deal. So I'm hoping he has three, I hope he has one of the horrible states. You, you would think a new a new actuary would get one of the horrible states, right? And say, hey, let's give him a California. Let's see what he can do with that. So we'll see. I, I don't know if he's on the pricing side or not, but that's what pricing actuaries do. So if you're a pricing actuary, you're going to be an expert on this. And pure premium is how many accents are they going to have? So if you think about this as the severity uh, and frequency, but you're going to discount it for time. But if it's auto insurance, it's not a big deal because it's only one or two years out. You have expenses. So the actuary is going to think, okay, how much does it cost us to get this business on the books, our marketing, underwriting? How much does it cost us to, to service this policy ongoing or changing addresses? And how much does it cost us to send a, a, a an adjuster out? Those are all of our expenses. And then uh, we'll go to Ron and get our, our profit piece. Oh, I shouldn't tell you all this story, but it still irritates me. So we had this new person who hadn't heard of all this. So I taught her all of this. She sends it to the actuaries and then she leaves. And I discover she made one minor mistake. So I fix it. And the chief actuary calls me and goes, Ron, you sent me changing her stuff. She put a lot of time into that. I was like, I just bit my tongue. But anyways, so sometimes you don't get any credit for your work, but that's fine. Um, she was a really smart person, so she picked up on it really fast. But still, she had never heard of it before. So I should have gotten a little bit of credit, but I didn't. All right. Um, <clears throat> so the profit side of the equation, we already talked about that. We already talked about that. Uh, required return. Uh, you know, we're talking insurance. We won't get into capital too much, but... For, for CAPM, we're talking about how, how cyclical is this business, how sensitive is it to the economy. And insurance, because they own stocks and bonds, there's there definitely a direct tie there. Um, one big issue for insurance companies on the liability side is inflation. That's a very systematic risk. Inflation does impact this industry quite a bit. Commodity prices impact this industry because they're rebuilding houses, buying cars, you know, steel prices, concrete, those kind of things. So there is some systematic risk on the liability side of this business. But again, this industry, I know you don't believe it looking at Yahoo Finance, but this industry typically has a beta above one. All right, risk-based capital. Um, just real, real quickly. This law actually was passed by all 50 states while I was at USAA. Um, this was in that job where I never went home. And one reason I didn't go home is the regulators needed someone to test all these laws they were writing. And guess who my boss volunteered to do all of that? So they said, we want you to run these laws against every company in the United States. We want you to tell us who passes, who fails. They passed one law. They were about to pass one law they sent to me and 60% of the industry failed the law. and said, you're not gonna put in receivership 60% of the industries. So I mean, that was that was a fun part. But it was very time consuming because I had to do all 3,000 companies. Um, but what they came up on risk-based capital is this, this law here. And they separated risk in the four categories. C1, do y'all remember this from a life insurance class? You remember that last problem? So it's the same thing on the life insurance side. C1 risk is asset risk. For property and casualty companies, the biggest part of that is probably their stock portfolios. That's considered to be really, really risky. C2 risk is their insurance risk. For PNC companies, it's that catastrophe risk. That's the biggest thing they're worried about there. The best thing to use there is what we've already talked about is their problem of maximum loss that you did on exam one. C3 risk is, in, is interest rate risk. So C2 risk is the biggest risk for property casualty side. C3 risk is a big risk for life insurance, but not really a risk for the property casualty side. Now you might say, well, if interest rates rise, bond prices fall, but that part is covered on, under C1. What C3 risk is life insurance companies are paying 5% to their policyholders and are making 7% on the bonds. It's the risk that those two get out of whack. So it's kind of a spread risk. PNC companies don't have that. And then C4 risk is a catch-all that they don't really know what to do with. So essentially what they call C4 risk is the risk that insurance companies go insolvent and you've got to bail them out. 
So that's that C4 risk. Um, but anyway, those are the four risks. One, we're really focusing on our C1 and C2 for insurance companies. I, I had this, the uh, the paper that the life actuaries wrote on this. I, I took it home with me. It's about 150 pages long. Uh, it's quite detailed how they went through every single part of this. So not to pick on the PNC actuaries, but the life actuaries developed the whole thing and then sent it to PNC actuaries. And they said, that looks good. We'll take it. And so it was, you know, the life actuaries did most of the work on this thing. Um, the PNC actuaries really had to spend time on the C2 risk, but they essentially accepted all of the C1 risk. Um, <clears throat> rating C's also have capital models that are very similar to risk-based capital. So if you want to be double A rated, single A rated, you have to have as much net worth as their models say. One cool thing I got to do is because I had this model of all the data for these companies, Moody's called me once and said, can we run our new model? Will you run it for us? And man, I said, of course I will. I got to see their model before anybody else. Uh, so that was pretty cool. I could, you know, I wasn't supposed to tell anybody, but they didn't tell me not to tell anybody. So I ran to Laurie and said, hey, Laurie, I got Moody's new model. This is how we do on it. Just letting you know. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. But we had this database. I could pull in all the companies. I could send them a spreadsheet. But again, I was doing that Saturday night at like 10 p.m. or something. It was a lot of work. Um, but yeah, I got to look at their new model. S&P had a new model, but they didn't ask me for any help on that one. Uh, they, they all look real similar. What they're trying to do is say, given the risk that you have, how much net worth did you have? So if you're doing a lot of homeowners in Florida, you're going to need a lot more net worth than if you're Geico and you only do auto insurance. You know, that's, that's the way they're going to look at it. And then some firms have internal models. Homeowners is going to need a lot of net worth requirement. Auto is going to have a much lower requirement. And, and that's important. We can kind of look at it maybe and see. We'll see if this works or not. So um, let's do um, well, all state. It, this may not work. We're almost out of time anyway. So all state has 103 billion in assets and 17 billion. So about 15%. And then progressive, which is auto. Now they have a lot more, so it didn't really work. Progressive is much better capitalized than Allstate, which doesn't make sense because Allstate has a whole lot more homeowners. But it may make sense because Allstate has a large life insurance company. So it's hard because of the mix of business. That's that's a pretty well capitalized business. That's like 20%. Remember, JP Morgan is less than 10%, and they're they're over 20% or around 20%. So, all right. So what we're going to do on Wednesday, Monday, you're going to come to class. And those of you on your cell phones, don't do that on Monday. I'll be really, really upset. All right. Don't do that to an outside speaker. It is just, especially guess how much we're paying before all the come on Monday. Zero. <laughs> so he's getting nothing. So show him incredible respect. I wouldn't even have your laptops open. Just sit there and listen. All right. Give him high respect. And then on Wednesday, Bring your calculators because we're going to be doing some some really massive formulas. All right, we're going to do the big math problem for exam two. All right, let's start there.